What's up, fellas? So one of the best exercises of all time for the chest is dumbbell press, but the problem is, is that most people do it really, really wrong, or at least wrong for what they're trying to get from it. Why should you listen to me? I wonder why you would listen to me about building pecs. Hmm, I don't know. Now, I also know that I said I wasn't going to make a whole lot more videos about single exercises or even groups of exercises, but there's enough wrong that happens with this exercise and enough areas of opportunity to touch on that I can't do that in 60 seconds. Now, real quick, the lift is designed to give you a greater stretch than you can get with a barbell. That's the entire purpose of the movement, which is why most people do it. And it's arguably the best exercise for an assistance to every other chest pressing exercise there is, whether that's bench press, whether that's dips, incline bench, you name it. Dumbbell press when executed properly is a great assistance lift for all of those things. And really just good for getting just big old fucking juicy packs, okay? I have a lot of free programs out here with a lot of different goals and purposes, but dumbbell bench is just a common accessory that I throw and recommend in literally all of them. The problem is, is that there's a couple things wrong with it. People either just do a partial lift with the exercise where they're just touching the, the heads of the dumbbell to their chest, which is less range of motion than a barbell, so you're not getting the stretch. It's more unstable, so it's like a less stable partial, which is just complete dog shit at that point. All right, fellas, post-editing commentary. I know that it looks like the barbell bench and the dumbbell bench have the same range of motion because they're both flat lines here, but just keep in mind that that bench is with an arch and that the dumbbell press is flat-backed, meaning if the barbell bench didn't have the arch, it would actually have a good bit more range of motion. So just keep that in mind because I know someone's going to say something in the comments. So people either, one, say that it's impossible to get a big stretch with big dumbbells, which is just complete coke. That's not right, which we'll talk about in a second. Or they say, yeah, I'm getting a big stretch with dumbbells, and then you look at it, and it's, it's still a partial range of motion. So I'm going to have a really easy four-step guide for you all to follow with how to audit how you're doing on your dumbbell press and how to approach it, dog. It's, it's very, very simple. So step one, you're going to need to see what you're doing. I like recording from a back angle, so like looking at yourself from the back, just so that you can see where your hands rest at the bottom. They should be resting below the plane of your body. It's very important because that means that you're getting a big stretch, you're getting the full range of motion. This is just a really easy way to see where your hands are at and where you need to be. If your hands are above, then you need to sink lower, you know that you can go lower, but when they're below the plane of your body, you're good to go. Now, step two, my buddy Sam just actually made a video about this, and I know we agree on this part, but you take a 45 degree grip just to move the big part of the dumbbells out of the way to facilitate being able to stretch lower. So a lot of people, when they say, oh, dumbbells, they're too big. I can't get a big range of motion. Guess I got to do something else. It's because the way that they're holding it, you need to turn that grip in about 45 degrees. I don't really like neutral grip myself just because I find that I just don't connect with that. But 45 is pretty intuitive and it feels good. It lets me get a big stretch. Three is super important. You're gonna you can row your elbows down as low as they'll go until you feel a big stretch. It should be a stretch that you don't feel on bench press. It may feel a little weird, like something you've never felt before, but congratulations, that means you are at the bottom of your dumbbell bench press and you're reaping the benefits. Congratulations. Just to demonstrate, yes, you can achieve that with big ass dumbbells as well. Last one is just a little secret tidbit. Don't destroy your gym floor and don't fuck up your dumbbells, especially if they're yours, bro. Like when you finish your last rep, just rock the dumbbells to your knees or your thighs rather, then use your momentum to stand back up, put your dumbbells back. Really easy, really simple. It won't work if like you fucking like failed your last rep. In general, I don't think you should be taking your essentially beyond failure with your dumbbell presses because then how are you gonna safely dismount them without throwing them, right? So just take your sets to failure, but don't go for a rep that you don't absolutely know that you have. I wanna talk some things to consider and then programming stuff, just because this is very important. I actually am beta testing a bench program right now called Black Swordsman. It's in the Beast Slayer series. But you either, on most of the day, is gonna be using a camber bar bench or a dumbbell press, right? It's a camber bar bench, obviously. The deeper range of motion is built into the bar. It's actually, better in my opinion than dumbbell press just because it's more stable you can rack it problem is not everybody has a fucking camber bar okay so fellas most of y'all are going to be using dumbbells so this this video is just vital even if you're not going to be running that program you're going to be dumbbell pressing more than likely but just one thing to consider is, is that deep stretch is going to feel weird at first 
you're not going to want to load up the weights that you're using for the partial range of motion dumbbell press because in all actuality that is more than you would probably be using on a barbell bench i say a good target to and i double check this with og faz lifts he agreed with me about 80 percent of your barbell bench press weight so let's just say that we'll make the math easy you bench press 100 pounds for 10 you're going to want to target 40 pounds per hand for 10 so it's 80 pounds it's 80 percent of 100. this math so simple even a fucking unga boonga caveman like me could use alternatively if you bench let's say 225 for 10 i think that's 85 or 90 pounds per hand for 10 so 80 percent of the load that you use on bench press divided by your two hands, obviously, because you have two dumbbells. Now, in terms of programming it as a lift, honestly, you could either use it as a main lift, so as a main builder that you plan assistance movements after, and it also shines, as we talked about, as an assistance exercise, which is how I most commonly use it. If you do choose to use it as a main movement, I really buy into treating those main movement exercises, your big performance metrics, the exact same way that you would as say a bench press on a strength training program. I personally really like linear periodization. I have a really easy guide on exactly how to progress that in the description. It's very comprehensive as well. Like I said, super simple to follow, but in short, you start with something lighter and you end with something heavier over a period of time, six to 10 weeks or so. In the case of dumbbell press, you may start with like 20s and end up with like a heavy set of five to eight. I just think that the one rep max dumbbell press is fucking stupid or even like a triple or something like that. It's just unwieldy at this point, but at five to eight reps, that's a pretty good parameter to end it at. I have an exact list of parameters actually to follow in that guide telling you exactly how to start it how to progress week to week and how to end it. Like I said, very easy to follow. And I buy into that a lot. Anyway, the idea is that when you rerun it, so you're gonna rinse and repeat the cycle, every week you're just gonna try to do more than you did the last time you were at that point. So if you do 50 pounds for 10 week one, cycle one, cycle two, you're gonna try to do 55 pounds for 10 or maybe do a little bit more reps, so on and so forth, rinse and repeat. Just read the fucking guide, bro, it's very simple, okay? Anyways, I buy into what I call performance-based bodybuilding or Johnny Bodybuilding for short. I got the name from being a longtime Eric Bugenhagen enjoyer. I think he called some guy who, who called him a small back for doing rack pulls, Johnny Bodybuilder. It's in my data banks. I know y'all know what I'm talking about, people who are there for it. How do you not understand that you're coping right now? That's all it is. Basically, with performance-based bodybuilding or Johnny Bodybuilding, if that's what you want to call it, we have a list of performance metrics that we treat just like a strength exercise on a powerlifting program. Instead of a big three, though, you have a big 15. And instead of lifting the most amount of weight at the expense of targeting the muscle optimally, we're using form that targets our muscles well enough, okay? So in my mind, I really buy into that because one, it gets people excited about getting good at things. I think that Honestly, you get a lot further as a beginner and intermediate lifter, arguably even as an early advanced lifter as well, by just trying to beat the logbook and then just maintaining your standard of form. You get a lot further that way because it gets you something tangible to work after, which is something that I really like. I also really like this approach to using strength periodization in a bodybuilding program because I find that a lot of modern bodybuilding programs don't leave the most room for momentum. I'm not saying they don't, obviously, like double progressions and things like that. Reset the weight and then start off easy and end up hard, but I find that they don't leave as much momentum as, say, a strength program, because that's what their uh, entire DNA is predicated upon, creating momentum to get to a PR, and then hitting small rep PRs throughout the way when you're on your lighter weights and shit. I really, really like that. I think that building momentum is a skill that you're going to need to use at some point. I like to use a sprinting analogy. You can try really hard to sprint as fast as you can over a long period of time, but after a certain point, you're going to be moving so slow into the point where you just stop fucking moving, right? We've all been there. You're just not going to be able to sprint as fast as you can for a prolonged period of time. You have your sprints and then your jogs and then your walks, and then your sprints. So you have to have those moments where you're going lighter to go heavier, basically. Now, in terms of using it as an assistance exercise, a fun workout that I really like to use is literally, you just pick like a target number of reps. So I really like doing between eight and 20 reps, 
start off higher reps when your main lift is lighter and go slightly lower in reps to maybe like eight to five or something like that where your main assist or main exercise is heavier. But anyway, you literally just do 20s, add a little weight, 20, add a little weight until it feels heavy and then you do one back down set. So one pump blast uh, set, I like to say. That's a really good way to get in more practice reps, get in really good work, get a good pump, and then also ensure that you're not using too much weight, going too intense or doing too much volume on what should be a secondary day, right? So your primary days, like your heaviest sessions that have most of your performance metrics, those need to be what you give your most attention to. If your secondary day is just another essentially heavy day, you're fucking up. And this workout is a really unga boonga, but really effective way of making sure that we do a good job on that secondary day. Last thing people might be wondering about is like, what level of incline to use? It doesn't matter, bro. Like, <laughs> just pick one. It's really important that before you start worrying about your incline, that you get the fundamentals of getting a full stretch down. Now, I will say that I personally prefer either a flat or a low incline, but then some people swear by a decline. It's like with everything, bro. You start off with learning the basics, and then as you master the basics, you start to, we won't even call it the basics, because that just sounds, it's not chatty enough. The essentials, we'll call them. Once you master the essentials, then you can start to find out what your preferences are. Some people might like the decline. Some people might like a high incline. It just depends upon what you like, but master the fucking essentials first. I'm gonna go over them again real quick for you. So four steps. One, record that back angle so you can see where your hands are at. Two, 45 degree grip. Three, row to the bottom, get that full stretch. Pausing a little bit also helps as well because you know, it helps you feel the stretch a little bit longer. Some people are more kinesthetic learners. Instead of just being told something, they have to do it physically. That helps you feel that stretch for longer. lets you know you're in a deep position. Four, you row the dumbbells to your fucking legs and stand up with it with the momentum. Really cool exercise, fellas. I just want you all to start doing it right. I don't say that out of derision or anything, but when an exercise is meant to be done a certain way on a program to progress and things like that, especially if it's a program that I'm putting out, I really just want people to interact with it in a way that will allow for that progress because I'll tell you what, dude, there's nothing worse than running through a program and then through my own user input error, it not giving me the result that it was supposed to. And I don't want y'all to waste your time with things. Last thing I'm going to leave y'all with, fellas, my buddy Sam actually made a dumbbell press tutorial before me. I had a Giga Brain play. He's been supposed to have made this video for two years now, and I basically was just tired of waiting for it. So I made a story on Instagram tagging him saying, like, look, man, I'm making this shit tomorrow. You ain't made it yet. I'm going to make it. Fuck it. Maybe that'll make you want to do yours. And then, I swear this dude must have just immediately hopped out of bed and fucking launched into the garage to make this freaking video. His version of the video definitely touches on a lot more strength training concepts and then just the general opinions and use cases that he has as a coach that I, I didn't talk about today because I don't use them that way. But there's a lot of similarity there as well in terms of the essentials. Please check that video out and then subscribe to him as well. I'm trying to get bro to 10K subs this year. Let's go. Maybe he'll get that freaking, um, what was this? Uh, the Ben and Jerry sponsorship. Bro, if you get the Ben and Jerry sponsorship, dog, you, you need you need to break off some of that, man, because look, man, I need the ice cream. Release the ice cream. If you like this style of video where I break down exercises that people legitimately just fuck up, I have one in mind for rows and RDLs as well. Make sure to like this video and subscribe and leave a comment saying you want to see the RDL and the row video because I'm really keen to do those as well. You fellas watch these videos now that you've watched this one. Have a good day.